George Foreman is a story for the ages. This two-time heavyweight champion is the only boxer ever to regain his title past the age of 40, and when he's not knocking out opponents, he's giving lives in his youth center uh, new meaning as a preacher. This Saturday, he leaves the pulpit for the ring again when he faces Shannon Briggs in a fight to be telecast on HBO. And George joins us li live tonight from Trump's Taj Mahal in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Champ, thanks for coming on and welcome to CBS. Thank you. I am not a, I mean, I'm a fan of boxing, but I don't study it greatly. But uh, in reading about this fight, I mean, you're giving this guy Briggs 23 years. I mean, as we say in golf, that's a lot of shots, champ. <laughs> you know, it's strange because I look for guys my age, but there are just not many of us around. <laughs> you see. It's not like I want it that way. I, I understand, but are, are, are you a little cautious about this? I mean, because, you know, 23 years, I mean, his reflexes are bound to be a little quicker than yours. No offense, Bow you know. No, no offense. I'll talk to you later about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but realistically, whenever you get in that ring, it doesn't matter. If this guy can whip me, it will not be because he's younger. And then when, if I whip him, it's not because I'm older. It's because he's the better man. And in training for this fight, <laughs> what, what regimen uh, do, do you go through now when you prepare for a fight? You know, we I'll see, we, it, we see it with, with the hamburger cookers and the cheeseburgers <laughs> and all that. But like a couple of weeks before the fight, what do you do? Now, I, I get pretty serious about what I eat. I actually have five workouts per day, and it consists of wood chopping, road work, the treadmill, punching bags, lifting weight. You name it, I'll do it. Right. And I got put in five workouts, so I got to eat pretty good. I'll try a uh, lean steak and fish on that grilling machine of mine, yeah. <laughs> of course, and lots of soup. And you look to be in pretty good weight right now. Your face looks uh, slimmer than the last time I saw you. What do you weigh right now? I don't know, uh, probably somewhere between 250 and 275. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's a long trip, huh? <laughs> it depends on, I missed breakfast this morning, you see. Somewhere between 50, 250 and 275. <laughs> now, are you into predictions? I remember Muhammad Ali would always say, you know, I'll get him in five, get him in eight. Have you got a round in your mind here when you think this thing might be over? I've tried that before, but uh, generally when I get in the ring, the guys are trying so hard to stay out of the way of my power. You just can't predict them anymore. There was a time they'd jump on me, and I'd predict I'd get them in the first and second round. But now they avoid me, and I don't know when I'm going to get them. And I just know that I'll try. You don't sound real confident here, George. Oh, I, I got to do like that because the, 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 my opponent is probably watching this, you see. And he's thinking, uh huh, the third round, that's when to watch out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What about the pre-fight badgering that's taken place between Muhammad Ali and his opponents, Mike Tyson and his opponents? You don't seem to get into that badinage before the fight with your opponent. You know, publicity stunts and that sort of thing. No, you really, most of the guys that are fighting, they're like kids to me. And it's not like you, you want to go out there and abuse these young fellows and, and be mean to them and talk harsh to them. You want to be as nice as you can because they could be my kids, literally. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't been knocked down in 20 years. I think, Not at all. I, I, I think you've said that the only time you would think about quitting is if somebody knocked you out. But it, People tell me all the time I should retire. Maybe I should quit. Let someone knock me down. If someone dust the floor with me, I'll never box again. I'll never put on gloves again. As a matter of fact, I'll not even have a conversation about boxing. Uh -huh. But they keep saying, uh, but they see, you see the young fellows with the muscles all in their stomachs, legs in the air, getting knocked down, part of their bodies thrown on the canvas. <laughs> and they asked me, when I asked George, when are you going to retire? That's not right. I'm still here. Let them knock me down. But is there a time when you wake up some mornings and you wonder to yourself, I know you're a man of, of, of the Lord and a preacher, when you say, you look up and say, you know, how long, oh Lord, how long? <laughs> yeah, many days. I told Lord, how long? Then all of a sudden I have another child. I've got nine kids, you see. Now I'm starting to have grandkids. And every time I go home, they lay back and say, Daddy, ah. Ah, bring food. Uh -huh. now, now it's like, bring Corvette, BMW. <laughs> they want everything. <laughs> and uh, I can't even talk them into going to college to, uh, to play football or basketball to get a scholarship. They don't want to get sweat on them. They want a, uh, free, they want a college education, no scholarship. And, and these colleges are robbing me. Do I'm you tell you. them about what you went through to pull yourself up when you were a kid on the streets of Houston? When you uh, want to be a tough guy and get a scar on your face? I try to tell them all the time they should go start from the bottom and work their way up like I did. And they say, yeah, Dad, yeah, sure, Dad, uh-huh. <laughs> they don't even believe me, as a matter of fact. It's been so long, they don't believe it. Let me, let me look beyond tomorrow night's fight uh, back there at uh, Trump's in Atlantic City. I don't know if you saw the recent Moore-Holyfield fight, but you fought both these guys. I think you knocked Moore out, and Holyfield beat you. Uh, uh -huh. Would you want to go uh, one more time with Evander Holyfield? 
you know, it would have been pleasant a while back when he first had his victory over Mike Tyson. There was a lot of storm about he's, uh, he's the, you know, the second coming and all of that. But now uh, it's not, it doesn't appeal to me that much anymore. I fought these guys. In my mind, I believe I whipped them all. You know how it is right, in my mind. Right. You, you, you understand. And, and, and what about Tyson? <laughs> would, you, would, you, would you fight Tyson? He would have been nice to fight him before he got whipped. But now that he's got beaten a couple of times, it doesn't even appeal to me that much anymore. It's like a, a case where you, I shouldn't hurt him anymore. He's been hurt enough. Uh, you sound like you feel sorry for your opponents, George. Yeah, these guys, I'm starting to feel sorry for these guys. I'm in an awful bad uh, profession to start feeling sorry for guys. But these guys are all getting whipped up. And if I hit them the way they, if they, for instance, Tyson's being knocked down by Holyfield, what would happen to him if I hit him? Boy. And it just when, wouldn't be right. When, when you read about the Tyson-Holyfield fight and, you know, the, the ugly incident here with the biting and the disqualification, what, what did you make of that? What was your take on that? Well, it was kind of strange, but I don't, I don't want to talk about them too bad because it's like I have two sons out there fighting. One decides to slap the other and bite the other in the ring. I get them in private and give them a good talking over, maybe a spanking, and uh, tell them not to do that again, but don't say anything publicly about them. I'm sorry that happened in boxing because now people think boxers are uh, sit around and file their teeth. <laughs> we, we, we are talking with the two-time heavyweight champion of the world, George Foreman. You should be on an airplane with a guy and I'm picking my teeth. He's like, oh, is that that boxer? <laughs> Can I have another seat? <laughs> George joins us tonight uh, from uh, the uh, Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. He'll fight Shannon Briggs there uh, Saturday, tomorrow night on HBO. And we'll continue with George. Again, tonight's program's on videotape, so the phones aren't up tonight. We'll be right back after this break. With boxer George Foreman, who joins us tonight from Atlantic City via satellite. You know, uh, shortly after the Oscars this year, we had this man in here, Leon Gast, who produced the documentary, When We Were Kings, the story of your fight against Muhammad Ali back in the 70s. Have you seen that piece of film? Have you seen that one? I have. I have. And, you know, I watched it with my kids. I keep thinking every time I see it that I'm going to win the fight this time. <laughs> I, I always lose. <laughs> Horrible. Well, we talked about that when Mr. Gast was here, and he talked about your attitude during that fight, that, that whole week in, in Manila, versus Ali's. I guess you got hurt uh, working out or training, and so you, you, you couldn't have the fight uh, on the schedule night. They delayed it. And Muhammad, yeah, and, and Muhammad Ali apparently conducted a love fest with, with the townspeople and the press, and you kind of stayed away from everything. And, and he felt yeah. that gave Muhammad Ali a great psychological advantage over you. Yeah, I've got lots of more excuses, too. <laughs> I mean, I can pick him out of the sky why I lost that boxing match. But the main thing was he hit me with this straight right hand that I didn't see, mm -hmm. and I came tumbling down. But you said it years ago. You know, I saw an interview with Mo Muhammad Ali and you, and, and, and you really described the rope a dope. Mohammed would lie on the rope, and I like a dope, kept throwing my punching power away. <laughs> I heard you do that. That is the rope a dope. I'm, I start. I should have been the star. I'm the dope. He, li he laid on the rope. Yeah. And, and before the fight, what was your camp telling you about Muhammad Ali as an opponent? I mean, from what, uh, what Leon Gass said, the man who made this documentary, they figured they, they, he, they were telling you Ali was almost a pushover for you. That's true. I was supposed to go down to, uh, uh, to Africa, pick up a big $5 million payday. The guy was old. He was over the hill. He was scared to death. There was gonna, no, beef, no, no competition at all. I had knocked out guys that he, he couldn't even whip. Right. Uh, Frazier and, and Norton. It was going to be an easiest fight I would have had in my whole career. That's what they told me. Then about the eighth, seventh, eighth round, when I hit him with everything I had, he started to ask, that all you got, George? <laughs> then I knew someone's lied to me. Yeah. <laughs> So that was about all I had. So, so you're talking back and forth while you're fighting at, at times. Oh yeah, he's talking to me. I'm not trying. I'm trying to land one on his jaw. Yeah. But this this guy was so strong mentally. I hit him with some of the best shots I've ever landed in my life, and it just he'd wake up and say, "Okay, uh, you so you've hit me. So what? I'm still here." Uh huh. Kept wondering if someone would show me an exit, I'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and what Tough about guy. what about that night at the Oscars? That must have been a big night for both of you. You know, yeah, consider, cons considering the fact that you came back after 40 and all that he's been through. Yeah, and you think about it, uh, you, you learn to love this guy because now looking at that, uh, that film, especially when we were kings, my kids cheering for him, starting to like him. And I remember the love that I initially had for Mohammed when I saw him in the early 60s. We all loved him. He'd come on television and you just see him for a second and yeah. you just, mm, he was the greatest. 
And I recaptured that love through that movie. Uh, and my kids started to love him in the same way. And I was happy to be on uh, the stadium, uh, uh, the, the stage with him at the Oscars. Can you believe that? Yeah, it was, a, it was a great moment for all of us watching. And the other thing that we talked about in the, in the making of this documentary, back in the 70s, if, if boxing has bad guys and good guys, and if Ali was perceived at the time as being a good guy, you were kind of the villain of the piece. You, uh, you, you, you turned your image around as a boxer. You weren't always Mr. Nice Guy. Not at all, because I just wanted the money and some fame and, and to hurt someone, actually. And I don't know in the order, which order you put it. <laughs> I don't know if I appreciated hurting guys a lot more than the money. Uh, but Mohammed had something. He was fighting for a lot of other things other than money. He wanted to really instill some pride through boxing. That was the only thing he knew how to do. And he wanted to do something to the world by way of uh, boxing. And this guy was great because of that. Now, you've said that you'll quit if somebody knocks you down. That's right. You, you not did. in the ring. I'll finish the fight. I'll get up and knock them back down. I understand. But I will not fight again afterwards. Uh -uh. Uh, after the Ali fight, I think you had one or two other bouts, and then you did retire. What, what mm -hmm. brought you to that decision back in the late 1970s? Oh, well, I had this uh, grand experience after my last fight was Jimmy Young in 1977 uh, March. Mm -hmm. I had this experience in a split second of vision. I was dead and alive in a split second. And started screaming that Jesus Christ was coming alive in me. I didn't believe in religion. And for 10 years, I devoted my life to that, telling everybody about uh, the good life and Jesus Christ. And I'm an evangelist. I am by profession an evangelist. I just moonlight as a boxer, you see. And what about the dichotomy, the, the disparity, if there is that, between the violence of boxing and the, and I tell you, I tell and, young and the people love that the you time. preach as a man of Jesus Christ? I tell young people all the time, they come to me and they, they want to try this, that, and, uh, and the other, you know, maybe even television guys like yourself. <laughs> they said, well, how, how can religion fit in there? I said, you know, it's best to take God along with you no matter what you are. If you take a little religion, you'll only be better at it. I could not have existed this long and uh, climbed the ladder that I've climbed without the, the, the grace of God. It's because of God I'm able to do this. And, and, so, and, uh, and, and, and so when you're decking a guy, when, uh -huh. when, when you're giving a guy his best shot, when he's going down for the count... Uh, I just say to him, Amazing grace. <laughs> <laughs> I got you that time. <laughs> you, you got us all more times than you know. <laughs> Let me take a fast break. We're talking with George Foreman, who will take on Shannon Briggs on HBO tomorrow night. You'll check the listings for the time in your town. We'll be right back uh, to wrap it up with the champ after this short break. with George Foreman, who joins us tonight from uh, Trump's back in Atlantic City. Now, you, you, you sought the, uh, the counsel uh, of the Lord, and you became a preacher and an evangelist, and then all of a sudden, boxing came back into your life. What brought you back to the ring? Well, we opened up a youth center in Houston, Texas, dedicated to helping kids, getting them off the streets, stay out of trouble, that kind of thing. Right. And, and after a few years, I wasn't making any money. I, I, I got broke. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. The, the truth of the matter is I didn't have any money. And I tried singing, but my wife told me, look, you are no Ray Charles. <laughs> so I had to come back to boxing to, to make a living. And, and I think it's an honorable uh, profession. And did you seek the counsel of anybody before you came back to this profession? Did you talk to your wife, talk to your family? Yeah, my wife, I told her about it. She said, don't do it, you're going to get killed. And I, like I told you, my kids, they just say, ah, bring home food, daddy, right, quick. Right, exactly. <laughs> had to be a knife and a fork in one hand. That's all they told me. Go, go, go for it. And you... And, uh, you, you, you mentioned the youth center. Tell me about that, what you do with these young people to get them off the streets. Well, in 1983, I decided, look, I was preaching on the street corners, doing everything I could, and I could not bring the kids. They wouldn't come to church, so I had to come to them. So my brother Roy and me started a George Foreman Youth and Community Center, just a place to hang, for kids to hang out. I was not going to preach any sermons, no Bibles, just come, hang out with me. Right. They thought the whole world was stealing and hudcaps and robbing everybody. And I had to dedicate some time to them. And I need to probably get back to that. To and when, and when they come there to hang with you, George, what, what, what do you do? I mean, do you tell them your story? Do they know your story and how tough you had it as a kid? They know all about it. You see, you see memorabilia all around the place and the stories. And they know about my life. But I don't say anything to them. I don't try to convince them to change their life. Right. Just let them know that I care about them. And the greatest sermon in the world is, you know, set an example. And that's what we do at the youth center. And what kind of results do you get? Have you measured any positive results from this so far? Yeah, you, you see guys who are in big, deep trouble. And next thing you know, they're bringing their kids to the youth center. And that's all you want because youth is such a, a, a brief occasion in your life. 
one day a kid is young and in trouble, the next day he's a grown man or a grown lady, and they come back and tell you thanks. Every now and then, maybe every four years, you hear something like, thanks, George, you really did help. Mm -hmm. and, and how did boxing help you? How, how was boxing the path to success for George Foreman? Because, you know, you, you had... A I was running out of money, and, uh, and I, I needed some money, and I didn't want to beg people to knock on doors and ask uh, someone to let me have some money. And that's the worst thing in the world, to go... When you need some money, is to ask for anything. If you want something, you work for it. I kept preaching that. Then I had to buy that product that I was uh, selling. Get out and go to work. Uh, people are telling me, you're too old, George. Sure, I was old. Sure, I have gray hair, but I need money. And it was time to get out there and work. And that's what boxing did. I mean, it told that story. Now, everybody knows, no matter what you want, especially the kids that I work with, you can work for it. If I can box, you can go to college. But when you were a kid uh, growing up in Houston, how tough a kid were you? Were, uh, did you join I gangs? Was, and... No, I was a one-man gang. I didn't need anybody. I would, I would see gangs down the street, and they would scatter. <laughs> I did like to fight, and I thought I wanted to... My greatest ambition was to have a big scar down the uh, uh, right side of my face and uh, 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 a big prison record. I wanted it all, and that, that, these were my role models, people of that nature. That's what I wanted, and I stayed in trouble until I discovered the Job Corps. Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty in 1964, and I got a chance. I joined the Job Corps by a commercial of Jim Brown, and that he gave, they gave me a chance. And where did the Job Corps take you? Uh, basically to a basic education. They gave me a chance to go to school. I got a general education diploma, started to really learn how to read and write, right. study, and next thing you know, I'm paying more taxes. Good gracious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I was sure eating up the taxpayers' money now, but they got me back today. When you came back, when, after your retirement in 77, uh, Archie Moore, I read, played a big part in your strategy uh, for the fights that you would have when you came back and eventually regained the championship, heavyweight championship. What did Archie Moore do for you? Archie Moore, he holds the, the secrets, the true secrets of boxing. This man was light heavyweight champion for almost uh, right. 11 years. Right. He's... So I called him up and told him, I said, listen, Archie, people are saying that I'm old. What do you think? He said, no, 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 no. If you're willing to commit yourself, I read his book, a ABC, Any Boy Can, which is a good book from top to bottom. And then I called him up, and he started to visit with me and showed me how to put my combinations together, how to cover up, protect myself to right. make sure no one hurts me. And I've copied his style for many years. Yeah. And, and what about your stamina now? You, you still have, I mean, can, can you go the distance? Like, you, know, you get to round yeah. 10, 11, 12, 13, you don't find and that, yourself? And that, that, that frightens the younger fighters more than anything else, that, hey, George Foreman is going to be there in the 12th round. If you haven't gotten him, he hasn't gotten you, he's still going to be there, and he's going to be strong in the last round. And uh, that's, I got that reputation now. And I got that from Archie. He taught me how to really control myself. And let me ask you your opinion on women as boxers, women in the ring. Well, a, a strange thing about uh, women in the ring, the, the only people that should be uh, asked about that are women. Because mm -hmm. they don't want to have to get into the ring. Just like people ask me, George, what do you think about boxing? I box, I can tell you about it. But women who box should ask other women sh what they think about it. And it's no man's business. Well said. And finally, how's the burger cooker business? Oh, the George Foreman lean, mean, fat-reducing <laughs> grilling machine. It's the greatest. Every home should have one of those things. If, you put if, it on there. If, if and not two. It. If oh, not two. Two. <laughs> two. If you got as many kids as I got, you put this thing on there and it knocks out the fat. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I have one in my room right now. I'm training, using it as a training equipment. You, it's a must. It's a must. Stop it. Believe Stop me. It. I'm stopping the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Mandatory takedown. It's the greatest down. thing. Good luck tomorrow night, George. Thanks. I God love bless. you. God bless. Take care. We'll be watching you, okay? Okay. All right. Good night, sir. Uh, George Foreman, uh, who'll take on Shannon Briggs on Saturday on HBO at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. Next, David Mamet, the legendary playwright. George in there, but he's still punching. David Mamet, uh, legendary uh, playwright and Pulitzer Prize winner, will join us. After, well, he's, George is legendary. David's won the Pulitzer Prize, and we'll be right back. <laughs>